Thank you. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Carol. You know, we have been dry running this. We have this, this great system we're using, but it's new. And so we've been trying to test run it and get the, get the tweaks out. And so, oh, great. Thank you, Leanne. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Carol. Where are you from? If you're comfortable sharing where you're from or the ages of your kids. And it's seven. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So we'll get started because I want to make sure that we're starting on time. I am Cheryl Gould. I am a parent coach and educator, and I also am the founder of Moms of Tweens and Teens and the executive director. And Jen is here. She's working the chat. She's We can't figure out why she shows up on the screen, but you have to come say hi. Come say hi. And Jen is here, and she is our marketing director hi. and our social media director. If you're on our Facebook page, um, she puts all of our great articles on there. She's awesome. She's so much more than um, our even our social media director and marketing director. So I'm so grateful for her. And we're happy that you're here. Very excited about what we are going to be talking about today. And I thought that we would get started. I want to give you a little poll. I want to ask you a few questions to start us off. So who here has a tween or teen that is overly emotional and you feel like you are just riding <laughs> riding an emotional roller coaster who is is uh, going through that hello polly good to have you betsy who is riding emotional i don't know can you raise your hand um so who here and have you ever heard it come out of your mouth to say what were you thinking who of us has thought that or said that? I have three kids that have gone through the teen years, tween years, and I have said that many times. Also, who has a tween or teen here that loves you one minute and doesn't like you the next? Who? <laughs> Hi, Shauna. I see you there. Oh my goodness, anybody? We really wanna know that we're not alone here tonight. I know that you're gonna hang up and you're gonna feel encouraged and reassured. That is one of our main goals here is for you to know that you are not alone. How about um, who has an alien that feels like they've moved into their house? Is anybody experiencing that? It does, it's like they change overnight. I remember my youngest, it was like, one day she was sweet and cuddly, and then the next day she woke up and she didn't want to have anything to do with me. So who's experiencing that? It's so painful isn't it? <laughs> when that happens. So one of the things that I main missions of Moms of Tweens and Teens is for us to know that we're not alone because we have so much support when our kids are little and we're in these play groups, and then as they get older, and they hit the tween years, there's not a lot of support out there. There's not, and then I tend to find with moms what happens, and parents, dads too, hello to any dads that are here. But what happens is when our kids start struggling, we tend to feel like we don't wanna tell people because then they might, if we tell somebody, they might judge us. One of our, some of us have friends that we feel like we can tell things to, and that's wonderful, but we, we're scared to tell people or they'll judge us that we're a bad mom or it might get back to our kid. And so we really want to normalize some of these struggles and challenges. Um, so that is a big thing. And I want to just start us on a little PowerPoint, but I'm going to come back and also show myself here because I don't want to just be all PowerPoint tonight. But I'm going to turn it on here and let's see. Okay, so there we are. And that was the little poll. And we can feel like this, can't we? 
<laughs> this was one of our memes and uh, you know it got like so many times because i think we can just relate to feeling that way like our kids are arguing with us it's an emotional roller coaster they don't want to do their homework and it can just be absolutely exhausting so understanding their brain and their development where they're at right now and what's actually going on with them is so important and it really will not only help them but it's going to really help us so who has seen this face before in their home? <laughs> this is my daughter who's now 28 and wonderful. And this was her when she was a tween. And, and she really started me on this whole journey to where I am now with moms of tweens and teens. And we were in Canada on vacation and she, if we would have allowed her to, she would have wrecked the vacation. She was grumpy the whole time. And then up, up here is my daughter who is now a freshman in college and I'm an empty nester. It's kind of sad, but, uh, she is taking a selfie with me. And of course I said something embarrassing and she made that face and then took a picture. So I'm sure that you can relate to that and just want to give you a little chuckle. This, oh, Jen, I didn't put yours in. I think I put it in later. Never mind. That's supposed to be Jen and her son. We'll see if that comes up. I think maybe I stuck it in somewhere else. But anyway, tonight, this is our, this is my, my vision for the evening. I want to help you to gain a deeper understanding of why your adolescent thinks, acts, and behaves the way they do. And when we understand what I have found, not only in my own life as a parent, but also supporting other parents, is that when we understand it can what's happening with them, it brings our anxiety down and it gives us a real sense of peace. And their brain development really impacts so much of the emotions, their impulse control, their judgment. And you're also gonna gain a new respect for the positive purposes of these brain changes and what the, the roles that they're serving. And I'm also gonna share five keys to breaking your tween and teen's brain code and meeting their developmental needs. So we're gonna talk about that in a little bit and how you can help to guide them. And oftentimes we wanna kind of control them when they get to this, this age because it's they're pulling away and we have so many things that we can be fearful of with technology and all that we can be dealing with. And so we want to really be proactive to think about, OK, how do we navigate this? And we're going to be talking about that as well. And when you can start practicing what I'm going to share a little later, it really will improve your relationship and bring out the best in your kids. And I have seen that over and over and over again. And moms are always emailing me and messaging me and in my groups and workshops and telling me what a difference it's making. So tonight I have a free gift for you. And if you stay on till the end, you are going to get an ebook. And this is what your tween and teen needs. And it's gonna really talk about their developmental needs and then how you can meet those in greater detail. And you're also, for everybody on here, you're gonna get a bonus bundle. So you're gonna get the recording of the workshop. You're gonna get all the, the worksheets that, that go with it that we're talking about here and conversation starters that are gonna help you be able to have meaningful conversations with your kids. Cause that's not always easy, right? Okay, you know what? I put an old PowerPoint in here for some reason. So we're just gonna, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, okay, this is my family. and I'm gonna tell you my story. So this is my family now. This is my husband and me. And this is my son who is getting married in June and my daughter, Lily, and my daughter, Sarah, was the, the one that had the little stink face on uh, at the beginning. And this is, my granddaughter, I actually have two grandchildren. In the other slide, I've added their picture. And this is my son's fiance and my husband and my, um, my father-in-law. So anyway, um, my story. I ended up when my oldest uh, was about nine or 10 and she was struggling. She, she was depressed, she was anxious. She was probably like 10, 11 and um, 
she wasn't doing her homework. She was angry and expressing a lot of emotions. And I was really struggling with her and I didn't know how to handle it. And so I ended up taking her to a therapist and through that process realized, gosh, I am the one that really needs the support. And, and I ended up meeting with a therapist and she invited me into this mom's group. And it was transformational because I got in there and all these other moms were saying me too. They were going through similar things. And we, we ended up where we were really started just working on, I started working on myself and how I was responding and reacting. And it had a huge impact, not only on the way I parented, but also in my marriage and in all of my relationships. So there was such a gap that I noticed for moms. There was really nothing for moms of tweens and teens. There wasn't a whole lot of support once our kids hit about nine or 10. And that's when we desperately need it because our kids start pulling away. They start what I call, what psychologists call individuating. And um, they all these things start happening, right? And so having that support uh, I know is so important. And so I wanted to give that to other moms. And we have grown now in the last two years to over 20,000. So there is a real need and it's super exciting. Um, okay, so I kind of told you a little bit about myself, um, just my personal story and how I got here. And I've been coaching moms for over 15 years. Um, and I told you about that. And I am working on a book and it's called You're Not Crazy, You're Not a Bad Parent and Know Your Teen Really Doesn't Hate You. And I find that <laughs> I had a meme and it went viral because I think that speaks so much to parents with kids this age. So I'm working on that. And then I love supporting moms through workly, uh, weekly workshops and our membership that we have, we have an online membership that I'll tell you a little bit about at the end. And um, I love to write, pub, you know, public speaking. And my mission is for moms of tweens and teens to, in, to have the support and the encouragement and the reassurance, uh, have a place, a non-judgmental and compassionate place to share their struggles and triumphs. And I say they're nationwide, but now we are international. And that is so exciting. Okay, moving along, we're gonna start. We're gonna get started very quickly. So you're not crazy, you're not a bad parent, and no, your tweener teen doesn't really hate you. Alrighty, so moody, disrespectful, impulsive, risky behavior, forgetful, disorganized, a roller coaster of emotions. These are so many of the things that we experience with our tweens and teens. And I especially know the disorganized, I put a bunch of papers, I have moms tell me about how they look at their kids' backpacks and they're like exploding with papers all over the place. And um, parents are telling me how all of a sudden their kids just don't seem like they're thinking, like, what are you thinking? Well, they're not, and you're gonna find out why. And then all the roller coaster emotions, they can be happy one moment and angry the next and just all of these ball of emotions that are, that are going on. So, so much research has been done in the last decade and it's very exciting and they're learning new things all the time and they're doing brain imaging and they're seeing that so much of this behavior with our kids is, um, makes sense with what they are actually, you know, how they're behaving makes sense with all the different brain developments that are going on. Okay, so a few things that I always say to parents. Um, your children are changing and they're trying to figure themselves out. That this time um, that they're going through, it is as confusing to them as it is to you. And there is so much more stress, there's so much more responsibility that they're feeling and going through, and their apparent reckless and rudeness, cluelessness, it's not totally their fault. Um, almost all of this behavior can be neurologically, uh, psychologically, and physiologically 
I explained. So we need to remind ourselves of that daily. And this doesn't mean that you sit back and you blame your kids' brains. We can, we can actually use this as a real time of opportunity. So what makes the adolescent brain unique? Well, one thing that makes it very unique, first of all, I want to just tell you something because I, um, with their brain, it is, it is amazing. It becomes faster. It's sharper. The amount of information that they can hold in their brain is incredible. And they expand their capacity for abstract and critical thinking. Um, it's just the, the, they can memorize like never before. They're just sucking. It's like their brain is a sponge during this time. So there's so many great things that are going on. But they're also, everything is being rewired and reconnected. And I thought this was very interesting that the brain is the last organ in our body to mature. And it really doesn't finish fully maturing. It's, I, I've heard, they say 25, but neuro, um, neurologists will say 30. So until it's really finally um, finished connecting. And I want to say to you, if you have any questions during this, there's a little bubble and tap the bubble. And um, Jen is going to write those down and then she's going to hand them to me at the end. And so I'm going to answer your questions. OK, so. They're dealing with a lot of these changes, and these are called synaptic connections, and they're hardwiring. I'm just going to go to the next slide so I can explain what's happening. So the first, so the brain is starting in the back, and it's going to develop to the front. So right now, the amygdala, if any of you have heard of the amygdala, it's a small part of our brain, but it is that fight and flight and it is really helpful when there's danger and when we need to stay alive and when we have a bear running after us it it makes us you know it's that impulse to to react really quickly that there's danger there so that part of their brain is is where a lot of the attention is right now, which is going, I'm going to talk about that. It explains a lot of how quick they are to react. And that is because of the amygdala. Fact number three, it is like I had said, it's wiring from the back to the front. The prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to develop. And that is actually the decision making, the problem solving part of the brain, the judgment, the self control, the executive functioning, all of that. And that is all right here in the front. So doesn't that make sense that here you've got the amygdala and the front of your brain, you've got all this reasoning, and that's the last one to develop. Only 80% of their brain is developed at this age between 12 and like 18. And every year the puzzle pieces are falling in place more. And also the emotional side of the brain and the reasoning side of the brain aren't fully connected. So that is why when your kid is having all of these emotions, they are not able to have that reasoning to actually make sense of all the emotions that we're feeling. But we can actually really help them through that process. So how does this impact their behavior? Well, they are, think of a high performance sports car. It's fast, it's powerful, but it does not have brakes and steering yet. They, it's just, they're all revved up and ready to go without those brakes and steering. And I've had two kids that <laughs> did get their driver's licenses and went out within the first month and had little fender benders. So there is, uh, you know, there's definitely, uh, some real truth to that when they get, it wasn't a sports car, but um, just no, no brakes and steering. And they can be very impulsive. They don't think about cause and effect. And they just are not connecting when I do this, then this will happen.
And they can also be very emotional at times. One moment, they can be laughing and happy and cuddling. And the next moment, they're rolling their eyes or they're yelling. And also, they can be very forgetful at this time. Because remember, the, the uh, frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, is what helps them with their organization. And that can be really hard for kids. And they can end up, I remember my daughter, um, well, several, of, you know, two of my kids, they would be very forgetful. And we would have to go back to school after hours. And my husband would track down the janitor to open the classroom door to get a to get a book, you know, and we did that a few times. And then he said, OK, well, you can't keep doing that. <laughs> Um, and, and they, they figured it out, right? But, you know, just those kind of things. And so really to remember to have grace towards them during this. And they're going to make mistakes and they're not always, and like I said, going to, going to connect that. And it is important to allow them to make mistakes because that is how they're going to learn. But we also want to guide them through that process and be talking about it. Okay. My interesting fact, and I am really sorry that I don't know how I ended up putting my my wrong slide um, slide in here, and I think I'll end up taking it off and just talking to you directly. But the interesting fact is that kids, because uh, that tweens and teens, because of this brain development and not having the emotional side with the reasoning side of the brain not being fully connected, they read. Our, they read our facial expressions often as anger. And so if you've had your kids say to you, why are you always yelling at me? Or why are you mad at me? They, that's how they are reading it. They don't have the full capacity to read facial expressions um, at this age. And so that makes a lot of sense too, doesn't it? When they're, they're looking at us and they think that, we're yelling or we'll get making a face. My, my daughter will always say, why are you looking at me like that? That's because of how they are not able to read our facial expressions. So how can you support your child through this developmental process? Whoop. There we go. So I think, so these are the five keys. And there were so many things I wanted to share with you, but with our limited time, I am picking out what I see as just the most important things that I that have really helped me and have helped other parents that I have worked with. And that are also connected to this developmental process that they're in and how we help them. Okay. So I am. Why don't you switch out? Can you quickly switch out? The I don't know if I can switch out. I'm going to let me see. She's saying, can you switch out? I'll see. I don't know why I put the old one in, John. Let me see. I'm going to cancel. Let's see. I'll cancel. Let, hold on, guys. I'm going to see if I can do it. Um, I don't know if I can. If I can upload. Hold on and I'll see. I think because we've already started, I might not be able to. So people haven't been able to get in the webinar. Oh, really? But I'm emailing Okay. Okay. Well, you know what? I think people like to see me rather than this. So I'm just going to stop it. Can you guys see me? And we don't know why Jen's, um, Jen's face is on here too. We're getting all the glitches out. Okay. So I'm just going to tell you, and you know what? Don't worry because I'll give you the, you're going to get all the notes. Okay. Um, from this, I worked really hard to make it look really good too. Um, so I appreciate all of your patience with me. Um, okay, number one, you want to understand that their needs are changing. They are in a transitional time right now. And it's it's this is a time that's hard for us. I mean, it's not only hard for them, but it's hard for us. And I find moms and dads talking often about this, this phase that they're in where there's this this come here, go away. And this, you know, they're still when they're, especially when they're tweens and when they're teens, you know, there's this, this feeling like I, I want to be independent and I want to pull away from you. And yet I still need you. And 
when they're pulling away, it can hurt our feelings. And so we have to really be careful not to take that personally and to just give them a little space, but also to lean in. They still really do need us. What changes is how we show up for them. And I'm going to talk about that. It really is, um, it's less now about giving advice, telling them, we could say, go put your shoes on, right, when they were little, and they would go put their shoes on. Now you say, go get your shoes on. <laughs> and it doesn't work so well. They might even go barefoot, right? Um, when we try and, and give them advice, it can fall on deaf ears. And so just navigating, you know, where to step in and where to step out. And I liken this to like, do you remember when your kids were little and maybe they ran, you know, they ran away, you know, into another room or maybe they're at the grocery store and then they had to peek around the corner to see if you were still there. Well, that is the same with our tweens and teens. They still need us to be there. And I remember my son too, you know, especially with my son, because boys, it can be a little tricky. And he used to follow me around the kitchen and he'd talk and he'd chat. And, you know, we'd read books together. And then he hit like nine, 10, he didn't want to do that anymore. And he wasn't talking as much. And, you know, he'd come home and he'd want to go up to his room. And so how, how do we, um, how do we, get them where we can still be connecting and looking for ways to do that. Um, a, a delicate balance of letting go, right? And staying connected. So know that they're in an, an individuation process. And also another thing is their friends are going to become more important than we are. And that is normal. So don't, again, just try not to take it personally and just know that this is normal. And if they have this huge um, longing right now to belong and to fit in. And, um, and so that is happening at the same time. So still finding those ways to connect with your kids and, and to lean into that, but also, also, you know, backing off and giving them that freedom. One of the slides I was going to show you is, um, and you'll get it, and I pretty much talked about it, but it's kind of what teens think they need and what parents think teens need. And uh, we think still they need advice, and we're going to need to work on giving a little less advice, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, so we want to guide and still protect them, but not avoid trying to control them because that backfires, right? So that was the first key. Key number two, help them to process their emotions. I cannot tell you how important this is. If you do anything else, this is so important. And there's a couple of reasons that this is so important. They are filled with emotions right now. And if you have a kid that is very expressive, they're expressing a lot of anger, um, they need to be expressing those emotions. And we have to get comfortable with them expressing negative emotions. And I know that we want to say, I know what you're thinking because I've gotten so good at that. And it's like, but, but, but my kid is so disrespectful. Well, that's not okay, right? But they have to learn how to express their emotions in responsible ways. And the only way that they learn to do that is through us coaching them. And when we shut them down, which I did with my first child, who's now the 28 year old, she was expressing all this anger. And because I grew up in a family where you weren't allowed to express any anger, what do you think I did? I was trying to shut her anger down, keep shutting it down, shutting it down, shutting it down. and that did not help her. And in fact, it created this dynamic where she became more anxious. She felt more depressed. And so we want to say to them when they're expressing their anger, we want to reflect the feeling. So your kid comes home and they're yelling about something and you can say to them, I hear you're really angry. Like this makes you really angry. 
You want to just validate the feeling. If you do nothing else, validate that emotion. You can say, wow, you seem really, you seem sad. And just say that. And the more that you can practice that, the more that you will see your kids start opening up and telling you more. And you can just continue to reflect back what you hear. And it's amazing how much they will start to talk. So just try it and see. Um, they need to feel heard and they need to feel understood. So right now, because of this whole brain development, when they're, when they're expressing their feelings, they're actually processing things out loud. And they have this great capacity when they can express feelings to start figuring things out. And I want you just to think about a friend that you really can go to and share your heart with them. And I guarantee you, it's a friend that you feel like you can just be wherever you're at. You can share how you're feeling. You can get it all out. And they're not going to try and fix it or judge you. You can feel safe. And then when you end up leaving them or hanging up, don't you just notice that you're like, oh, I feel so much better. Your kids are the same way. They need that. They need you to be that safe place, that actual dumping ground where they can talk about how their feeling. And we're going to talk about boundaries around it. It doesn't mean that you have to be a doormat, but to be that safe place where they can open up and they can know that they can talk to you. Uh, number three, you want to support them to come up with solutions to problems. So this is the big shift that I'm talking about. So they don't have that, you know, that frontal lobe where they have trouble with actually um, doing the whole problem solving, the executive functioning, the cause and effect. Well, this is where you're going to help to start laying down those tracks for them to be able to start becoming more self-aware where they're going to see the cause and effect that can happen when they do something, but not to tell them. Because what we do is we go in and we start telling them. We give advice. We lecture. We nag. We tell them what they could have done differently. And Jen is handling the chat. Who here has tried that? And how is it working for you? Because usually they don't go, yeah, mom, you're right right? It doesn't usually work. So instead, we want to, what we want to do is we want to start asking questions, okay? And I have this. It's going to be an all in your handouts. So what do you think you want to do about that? See how different? What do you think you want to do? Rather than telling them what you think they should do, you say, what do you think you want to do? What might you do that would help? So if they're complaining about their homework, what do you think you need? What might you do that would help you? Uh, do you want me to share my thoughts or advice? So you want to you want to ask them first. And the hardest part <laughs> for me is when my kids say no, and then I have to zip it. That's very hard. And they they've laughed at me because I've ended up throwing it in there anyway, because sometimes it's so hard not to do that. But we want to just try and then zip it. What might help you right now? Or how can I support you? And, and that way you're not inserting yourself, but how might I support you? And if something has not gone well, to say to them, what do you think? What do you think you do differently next time? You see how that's, there's a whole shift going on. And also what we have to be willing to do is we have to be willing to sit in the discomfort of not getting that advice and not fixing we're jumping in there. We're so quick. We're such good fixers. I mean, don't you sometimes feel like, man, if I, if they, if my family would just do what I told them, then everything would go great, right? <laughs> I definitely can feel that way. Um, and when they mess up, to avoid criticizing them and saying, I told you so. But just to sit with them and to ask them, what are you learning? To just be more open. You know, this is such a learning process for them that we don't want to shame them when they make mistakes. So that's my, that's um, the next one is to, well, I'll get, I had another one, but I'm just going to kind of move on. Number four, provide boundaries while allowing them to make mistakes. And kids, one, I was just recently reading a, um, a study and kids want 
boundaries. Actually, the most well-adjusted kids are the ones that have rules, but they are very clear about what those are. So what's really important is that you get clear first. Get clear, sit down. If you are in one of my groups, what we do is I have, you, I have parents sit down and think about what are those areas that you are feeling challenged for, with right now with your kid? And what are some, what are your expectations? What are your boundaries around that? And get very clear, just like write it all out and pick one or two things. We don't wanna, you know, sometimes we can bombard our kids or we can go to a workshop and we can learn a bunch of stuff and then we go home full steam ahead. And, and what you wanna do is kind of pull back, but just clear yourself. What do you wanna work towards with your kids? Where are you seeing some of the weak, weaknesses in the areas that you want to start, you know, addressing and then get clear on what that is. And one of the ways that you can talk to your kids about that is you can use the phrase, I'm noticing. You know what? I'm noticing that your, this is one of the ones Jen, Jen uh, at the workshop, sometimes I'll, I'll say, I'll ask her to share this, but you know, I'm noticing that we're fighting a lot about you getting off the gaming. And so I wanna talk about how long you're gonna be on and what that's gonna look like. And then getting their feedback. Because when you can, they can talk to you about it, it doesn't mean that you have to do what they're coming up with, but you wanna get their input so they feel heard. And then you wanna be able to work with them with that. Well, you know what, three hours on the game is too much when there's homework to be done. So let's come up with something else. How about this? How about that? You wanna work with them with that, okay? And then also um, allowing them to make mistakes. They are gonna make the mistakes. There's no doubt about it. Just knowing they're gonna mess up. That is part of the learning process. And what we don't want is we wanna to talk to them about, about their brain. So you're gonna be able to, when you get your handouts, you're gonna have some good things that you can talk to them about, about how their, how the cause and effect of things and how their brain works and, and being able to share that with them. And, um, and just, you know, how their brain, they, they need to keep on, you know, thinking about, okay, my brain, I need to be thinking about what that choice, you know, what might be the end result of that and getting them without judgment, getting them to think about that. Um, number five, be a role model. So this is a big one. And um, we hear this a lot and it's kind of like, okay, be a role model. It's kind of scary to think about, <laughs> um, you know, how, you know, how do I do that? But like when I, I like I was um, describing in the beginning about with my daughter, I was not comfortable with my own emotions. So that was an area that I had to learn how to navigate, how to be able to navigate anger because, because I hadn't learned to do that myself. That was really difficult to be able to um, help her to navigate that. That's why it's so helpful to get support um, as a mom and to be able to talk about these things. So just know like if you're yelling then and telling your kid not to yell, then, which we all do, right? There's like no shame. We're not gonna do it perfectly. There's not such a thing as a perfect parent, but just kind of thinking, are there things that I'm expecting my kid to, to do or not do? but I'm not willing to. Uh, I was working with a mom and she was she she tends to um, be very disorganized and very messy and she spends a lot of time on her computer. And what do you think she was wanting her son to be more organized and more responsible and not be on his computer as much? So she had to really take a close look at that and say, huh, he's watching me and I'm telling him not to do these things, but I need to clean up this area in my own life. If I am going to model this, you know, I'm gonna want him to be responsible in this area. Um, so just thinking, thinking, think about that and reflect on that. Where are we maybe 
asking our kids to do something that we're not doing. Um, so now, let's see, I don't think I have it on here. I wanted to tell you, it's on my other slide, but I wanted to tell you about what, and let me see if I've got it on here. I think I do. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat. This is something that I wanted um, to offer you. Okay, I'm going to put it in. I think it'll come up in the chat. I had it on my little screen, but um, this is actually our parenting. It's our one-to-one -one parenting membership and our inner circle membership. And for two weeks, we want to provide it, give it to you for one dollar for fifteen day for fourteen days, and with that, and I can't read my little writing, but I think I know it. I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to have support because this is the most important job that we will ever have. We are creating the next generation of kids. And I will tell you, I would not have the kind of relationship that I have with my kids if I hadn't gotten the support, this kind of support in my life. And I want you to imagine what it would be like to be in a community where you could share what was going on and you wouldn't be judged. And there were other moms. It's like kind of like there used to be play groups when our kids were little and it would, you know, it's like a play group, but with support and you get all kinds of great stuff for it. I do a two, um, two times a month. I do a, um, a live call where you can be on this call and ask questions. And I have, we do great exercises that I have, you know, that um, worksheets and we, I pick a topic and we get to talk about that. And also where you're gonna get all kinds of great information. And then we have um, two eBooks. We have a disrespect eBook and we have a technology eBook. And then you get 10% um, off of the next um, workshop that I do. And so, there's so many great things that you'll get from from this where you can get the support that you want that, that you want and that you need. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, so click on there and you can. Can you see it? Did it show up? I don't see it. You don't see it. Does anybody see it? I don't know. Let me see. It takes you to the page. Oh, you know what? Put the can you put the link in? Put the link in for them. Can you do that, Jen? I can, I think. Okay. All right. She'll put it in the link and then you can look at it, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna do now is, did you get some questions, Jen? Um, I had one person ask about social media. Oh, that's a good one. What was the question? The question was... Yeah, put it in the chat. I'm going to pull up the chat. Let's see. Oh, the link is in there. I just don't see it. Okay. Well, ask your questions, okay? And so I... Hints on social media. Oh, here I see it. Okay. Hi, Brooke. I hope you're still with us. Please share helpful um, hints on social media with teens. Okay. Well... In that ebook, you will get, um, if you join, you get this whole technology ebook. And we have, we have a cell phone agreement. We have dangerous apps um, that you need to be careful of and watching out for. Also, um, Jen and I are going to do a technology workshop um, to help you. I'm going to drink some water to help you with this. Um, it's a very broad question um, and just your, you know, some tips on that. Um, I think you have to really think about um, really weigh the age of your kid. It's not just the age of your kid, but it's the maturity of their kid, of your child. Um, are they ready to handle having a cell phone? I am a big believer I'll be 100% honest here. I'm just a big believer in not allowing them to have Snapchat uh, until they're, you know, until they're older and you feel like they're mature enough to handle that. Um, but I also, um, 
I know that moms can become very fearful around social media. And I actually wrote a blog post on as they get older, not reading their texts. And I talked about the negative consequences that I experienced with my youngest again, <laughs> um, reading her texts and how their kids want, want privacy. Now, when they're younger, I'm a big believer that we need to monitor things because they are young and they have to learn that brakes and steering and they need us to help them. But as they get into high school and a little bit older, unless you're really concerned that they're, that they're doing something that's harmful, dangerous, I say, we don't want to be reading their texts and you want to set limits. Um, and some, an idea of setting limits would be, you know, we're going to take our cell phones and we're going to put them away and have, you know, some no cell phone time. So that would be, that would be one. Okay. Okay. And Betsy's too. Okay. Thank you. Um, go up. Yeah. Because Carol's question is kind of similar to what you're talking about right now. Okay. Something All right, Carol, I'll go. Okay. What about when I'm trying to include my son in the solution? Computer gaming time versus homework, but he refuses to offer input flat out refuses okay well carol good for you that you're asking you know that you're trying to include him and that's where you're just going to have to set down that boundary so i would ask you what's the biggest problem the thing that is frustrating you the most right now that you feel like has gotten out of hand and what do you think is reasonable and thinking about that. And if he's not doing his homework, then, you know, then having a, you know what, I'm noticing you're not doing your homework, so there's not going to be any gaming during the week. You have to take a tough love stance. And you know what, they are not going to like it, and it's okay. They do not have to like it. What you want is to validate the feeling. So he is maybe gonna, I know I know this has happened a lot where kids have the gaming taken away and they just, they, they really go, for lack of a better word, ballistic with it. I mean, it really, because the brain, and I didn't really get into this, um, they are, their brain is seeking pleasure. And the dopamine that comes from gaming, and from a lot of the social media, it's pumping dopamine. So they get addicted to it. And we have to really limit them. And we just wrote recently a blog post on, on two hours, only two hours screen time is what's recommended in a day. And so we do need to limit it. And they're not going to like it. And you can say, I get it. I get it that you don't like that I'm taking this away from you. And yet, homework is your job right now. School is your job right now. And so if you can show me that you're going to do your homework, you can earn that back. But you have to show me that you're mature enough to be able to handle it. Does that help? Yeah, okay. Computer games, YouTube is the main source of problems. He's homeschooled and most work. I know the most work is online is tough. Um, so I cannot remove the computers from the equation. I also want to say normalize YouTube a little bit. Um, and, and you can put, and Jen is really good at this, you can put um, uh, things that, you know, where you can actually uh, block harmful, you know, the harmful stuff that comes in. But uh, YouTube is like the television now. I mean, parents complain a lot about that, but that's their Brady Bunch or <laughs> their Partridge family or whatever, you know, whenever you were growing up, that is, their TV now. So they're, most kids are watching quite a bit of YouTube. So there's some of it that we have to normalize. Oh, good. You put that in there, John. Yeah. And we might want to answer Betsy's question. Okay, Betsy. I am very social and my son is not. I worry about his lack of wanting to make plans with friends. He is happy just staying home on electronics. Um, Betsy, how old is he? I'm wondering. Um, and I'm thinking... You know, he's probably, I'm wondering, you know, if his dad is an introvert, 
you know, he's probably an introvert and that's more of his personality that he needs downtime. Um, okay. Oh, he's 13. You put it in there. Thank you. And we'll do five. We'll just, we'll do five more minutes of questions just so I, I didn't say that at the beginning. So, um, um, what were, where was I? I got distracted. I'm sorry. Oh, um, wait, I was looking. Yeah. So, oh, the being introverted. Um, yeah. So it's tough, right? It's tough because, um, my son, he plays sports, but he did not go out very much at all his first two years of high school. And then he started his junior year going out more with friends. Then you have the kids that are going out with friends all the time. And then the parents are wor worrying about the drinking and the drugs and all of that. Right. So it's like this. There's there's two extremes where if they're keeping to themselves and they're on electronics. So I would think of what some ideas of what you might get him involved in. I had a mom that is in one of my groups and her son was the same way, very introverted, didn't go out, didn't wanna leave his bedroom. And it ended up that she got him and he was pretty resistant, but she got him in sailing. And he ended up loving it. There was an older, like a high school, you know, like a senior, I think. And he kind of took him under his wing and that ended up being what he got excited about. And being able to say, you know, there's one one activity that you need to pick. And so get especially. Um, oh, I was getting you confused, Carol. You have the homeschooler. Yeah. So just, you know, thinking about it. OK, Tiffany. So I hope that answers your question uh, that that helps. But just thinking about what's maybe one thing you could get him involved in. And then if he's spending too much time on electronics, then you might want to cut that back. Okay, Tiffany, my 10 year old daughter has recently had trouble going to sleep in her bed. She has started to have a little anxiety and wants to be in our bed. We've tried yoga, journaling, worries, which has helped, some suggestions on how to get her back in her bed. Yeah, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you sure you want to? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, oh um, well, you can actually speak to that because you had that, Jen. What did you, you ended up, I mean, it was tough. I still have it. Yeah, where he, um, um, I think, did you ask her, Tiffany, what might help her? You know, have you talked to her about what idea and bring armed with I had a little back. That's because I just turned mine on because I was going to. Oh, go ahead. You answer. Well, for us, one of the things that has really worked is the Calm app. Oh, yeah. The Calm app's great. So he's able to listen to bedtime stories. You want to talk on mine? I don't know. Can it, is it coming through? No, no it's you. Mine. What? The Calm app has helped him. I just didn't want them to have feedback. Are you guys getting feedback? Um, yeah, I'm still getting feedback. Can you turn it off? No, it's gone. Sorry. So the Calm app? The bedtime stories. As yeah. The yeah, there's Tiffany. There, I, I actually use them. They have one with Matthew McConaughey. We'll give you a bedtime story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it so much. So the Calm app, you have to pay a little bit of money, but it's great. And so, and they have ones for kids too. So try that. So that's helped Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helped a lot. I know I, I recommend that to a lot of moms. Um, and maybe, yeah, just getting her to think about what that is. Maybe you can give her a back scratch in her own bed and maybe even work on amount of time and working towards you know, her being on her own. But it sounds like she needs comfort. And even trying to encourage her to talk about how she's feeling. Get her to talk about it and uh, what she's feeling anxious about. And um, that usually will help a lot too. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, I'll do, you know what I'll do? I'll do, let's see, it's 7.53. So I'll do about five more. I said five. Um, and then whatever I don't get to, I'll email you guys. Okay. 
So what about the rooms? My daughter's room is a mess. Can't tell dirty clothes from clean. Where's dirty clothes? I told her that she can't eat in her room anymore because I couldn't take the dirty dishes in there. Oh, golly. Um, I know who who is out there that's like, me too, me too, me too. Just know, Jill, you are not alone. This is a big issue. Um, again, you know, I'm noticing your room. Let's come up with something because it's driving me crazy. I don't want to be nagging you. I don't want to be constantly lecturing you. And uh, where can we come to some sort of an agreement and be somewhat flexible? I'm a big believer in picking your battles. And um, what I ended up doing, and I am a clean freak. If you can see behind me, my, I have my little Easter stuff. I'm pretty clean. It's the only way I can think straight. But all three of my kids were slobs. And um, when they hit these years, and even my son, who was so clean, and he got really sloppy, and I just ended up, I closed the doors. I just decided I'm just going to shut the door. But it really, it was, it was like chalk, you know, like fingernails on a chalkboard. Um, and then what I did, I had them every Saturday morning, they would clean their room before they could go do anything. So you don't have to exactly do that, but talk to her and figure out if you can come up with something um, where you can negotiate that and, and see what happens. And just try different things. Like if something is not working, try something different. And you can say to your kids, hey, this isn't working. Let's come up with something. Let's talk about it. Okay. Um, she doesn't want to be alone in her room now. Not sure what sparked this. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, Tiffany? It's There's a lot going on at 10. You know, there's a lot going on. And, you know, just to be able to try and encourage her to open up a little bit and um, see if she can talk about it. Um, and, you know, listening to her, listening to that anxiety, I will tell you this: she won't be sleeping in your room for the rest of her life. You know, and this is a this is a phase she's going through. And I think that we would just have to really be patient with them and and just know, you know what? It's OK. Maybe pull in a mattress. And I my son, who is huge, he's six, three, a big guy. When he was when he was 10, 11, he would pull his mattress into a room to sleep and it would kind of drive me nuts and um my husband said you know what he's not going to want to do this and you're going to be really sad so you know just let him do this but you know what he said he said i don't want to grow up he was starting to feel all that pressure and he's like i don't want to grow up you know i feel sorry for you and dad <laughs> would say you have to be grown up and it seems like there's so much pressure so they're starting to feel the rumblings of that and it can cause a lot of anxiety so I hope that helps yeah Tiffany good for you that you brainstormed a lot I just read that and you know what maybe you know just letting you know just being okay with this being where you're at right now I think a lot of that is we have to just kind of be okay with where we're at right now um, so thank you. I'll check into the com map. Great. Well, I hope this was helpful. And um, I would love for you to try our membership. I am going to, um, in the next two weeks, I'm going to do another one of, you know, I'm going to do another workshop. I'm actually leading one locally. I live in the Chicago area on anxiety. So I will do that with whoever joins too. And we can talk about it. Thank you for being so patient with um, our little glitches as we're getting used to this new technology. It ended up being a little bit more of a learning curve than we anticipated, but it's fabulous. It's webinar jam, but we'll get the hang of it. And um, I would love you to join. I would love to get to know you better. Um, Jen will send the link so you can read more. You know, you can look at it. It's a dollar for the next 14 days. Thank you um, for all of you that stayed on. And when you sign up, you know, you'll get a lot of these resources. And um, I just I would love to support you and get to know you better. So uh, you can cancel at any time. Um, but I would love to provide you with that support. That's why we're here. And we'll be able to talk more about all this stuff in detail. Okay.
Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Anastasia, I, um, oh, you joined my group. Oh, I'm so happy, Anastasia. You know what? Um, I hear you and I'm so glad that you're posting that because you're not alone in that. Uh, it's so accessible now, porn for our kids. And we will be talking about that, okay? So I'm so glad you joined. And uh, thank you for the workshop, lots of useful, especially at Five Keys, great. Thank you, Carol, goodbye. And Leanne, I'm so glad it was helpful. Um, he will be playing baseball. I'll bet, um, Betsy, we have to talk. You better sign up. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, high school is much better than junior high. It really is. There's a lot. It's kind of like a whole new beginning. Okay. And mo yeah. Well, all right. I better get off or I'll keep on talking and talking. But it was great to be with you. Thank you for staying on. And um, I look forward to getting to know you better. Okay. Bye.